Welcome, Welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey friends, welcome in to the podcast. This is episode 109 and this is an interesting one because we are going to be looking at a different type of web design business model and it is a subscription business model. What's extra interesting about this is that I found this to be very rare in web design, although I think it's becoming more and more common and more people are interested in this because of the lovely two words that it creates. And those two words are recurring income. We've seen this in all industries. If you think about Disney Plus or Netflix or, well, just about anything nowadays, there's all sorts of subscription models. I mean, I, I look around at my life. So yeah, I've got Netflix, got um, Disney Plus. I've got my razors from Dollar Shave Club that are on a subscription model. We've there's My, my auto mechanic has a subscription service now where um, you can get a better deal if you do like a subscription option. So there's all sorts of examples in our lives today where there's a subscription business model. Now, how does that translate to websites and can it work in web design? I'm excited to let you know that it absolutely can work. And in this episode, you're gonna hear from somebody who's doing it and doing it very well. This is one of my close web design students, Steve Schramm, who started his web design business on the subscription model. And he opens up in this episode about his entire process. He talks about the beginning and what that looked like and what ple- what seeds were planted for him with the idea of a subscription design and web design type of service. And it was really interesting because as you'll find out in this episode, It is a slow, long game type of approach, meaning if you do a subscription service, you're generally not going to make near as much in the beginning as you would if you're charging three, four, five thousand dollars for sites. However, there is a lot of power in building your bottom line and uh, building that recurring income. And also it, uh, it offers a lot more opportunities for clients who don't have a big budget, but can pay you a lot more in the long run and you can create lifetime clients with this model. So I found this conversation fascinating because it's not a model that I did. The only recurring I had as a web designer was my monthly maintenance plan and SEO services. So this was really fascinating to me, to be honest, as I went through this conversation with Steve, it got me thinking, man, if I could do things differently, I don't know, maybe I would have chosen a subscription business model because it was pretty cool to hear how he's done it. And what was really interesting about this is that he recently went full time into web design and he did it without having to have any feast or famine. You know why? because he built his subscriptions and he built enough recurring revenue to cover his bottom line. And now he's able to build and scale his business around this. Now it does come with a lot of, I was going to say cons. I don't want to say cons, but challenges. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions like, how does that work? How does it work with redesigns or hourly work? How does, you know, how does a a full big e-commerce build work with a subscription model? Well, rest assured, we answer pretty much every question I think you can think of in this episode. If you do have additional questions though, just leave a comment on the post. Go to joshhall.co slash 109. I'm sure Steve would be happy to answer any questions and I'll chime in there as well. So I can't wait for you to hear this one. This was fascinating. Now, if you do not have any recurring income in your business, I want to help you with that. And the best way to do that is with, as I mentioned earlier, a website maintenance plan. This is one of the key things that you will find out in this episode that you need to have in place if you're going to have a subscription-based web design model. So if you don't have a website maintenance plan, or maybe you have one that you're looking to take to the next level, I have a website maintenance plan course. It's open right now. I've helped students from all over the world build recurring income through their maintenance and hosting. I would love to help you as well. So join that today if interested. And without further ado, here is my man, Steve Schramm. Oh, that was kind of cool, Rhyme. Didn't even mean to do that, but here we are. We're going to talk subscription-based web design model. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Let's dive in. Steve, welcome to the show, man. It's awesome to have you on. Absolutely. I am uh, more than excited to be here. Well, I apologize for the complete noob error that I had. This is the second time we're recording this intro because I had the wrong microphone <laughs> selected for our recording. I'm so glad I caught it early on because that would have been, uh, I don't think anyone would want to hear me do a whole episode for my AirPods. So uh, we got yeah. the right mic on now. We're starting over, but man, I am so pumped to have you on because I have such a, a, a kinship feeling with you. You are an awesome web designer and you're a savvy entrepreneur. 
uh, you cut, you worked in a you know music studio. We have similar background paths and, uh, those always make the best web designers and best entrepreneurs. So I'm super excited to have you on. And what I'm really excited to dive into is your business model because you did something very different and it's becoming more and more popular now. And that is a subscription based model. Uh, very different from what I did because I just did feast and famine, one and done services. And I, that was before I had any sort of recurring income. So I killed myself with really good months and really bad months with that model. <laughs> but you started off with a subscription model. I'm excited to dive into that, to, to hear more about that because you recently went full time and it's been a, a joy to see how much progress you've made. And even just the last couple months that you joined my web design club and man, I'm, I'm so pumped for you. So yeah, before we dive into it though, do you want to let everybody know where you're based out of? and what you do with your business right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I am from uh, Statesville, North Carolina, which is right down the road, about 30 or 45 minutes from Charlotte. So there's a good landmark um, that everybody knows. And um, so I serve mostly uh, small business owners, uh, nonprofits. I do some work for uh, for ministries. And uh, I mean, that that's basically the gist of it. I, I, I started out doing web design um, years ago for a recording studio. So I worked in a recording studio studio, played drums, bass, guitar, did some producing. And uh, part of what we would do for clients is actually um, build their websites. And so I started out by doing content for things. So, um, you know, one of the, the big conundrums, and I'm sure you guys will identify with this as a website designer, one of the issues is um, you have these people who you're designing a website for, and uh, you don't know anything about these people, but you're supposed to populate a website full of content that has to do with these people. And so um, what I used to do was basically take what they would write, be it a bulleted list or a few paragraphs or whatever, I would take that and uh, turn it into something that actually sounded halfway uh, decent. That's how I got my start in it. And then when tools like Divi and things like that came along, I, I, that's when I started getting into web design uh, for my between there, but that's the highlights. And, and now here we are today doing it, um, I guess, full time after having been in the business for about five years. So, well, yeah, and I'm excited to dive into a little bit of your story because you were working part time and you, and you would you developed this business model pretty early on, if I recall, and I want to talk about that because let, let's just do it. Let's dive right into the subscription-based model that you have. But again, what was interesting is you're working part-time, and from my understanding, you implemented this pretty early on, right? Did you start with the subscription-based model, or did you do any one-and-done type of feast and famine type of work? Yeah, so that's a good question. So a little bit of context. My... Um, mentor in business, the reason that I fell in love with entrepreneurship, because I, I didn't wake up, like I, I didn't plan this. So we talked about this a little bit before we were recording, but, but I didn't, I didn't plan this. I never woke up one day and said, I think I'll be a, a web designer for the rest of my life. It just kind of happened. And, um, my love for business kind of came that way too. When I was working in the recording studio, um, the guy who owned it, uh, he's kind of like a, a second dad to me. Um, his mentorship was, was really something that won me over and uh, into the business world in general. And one of the things that he preached from the rooftops now, now this is before I listened to a single podcast, a single book. This is before I was an internet marketing nerd, like I am now. Um, and one of the things that he beat into me was recurring income specifically he used the word residual. I guess that's the old man's word for it. I don't know. But he mm. said residual income is the name of the game. Whatever you do in business, if you can figure out residual income where you're making money over and over and over again um, without having to generate new business, then you have got it made. And um, I, uh, th the context was, it was actually really fun and really interesting. The model that he actually developed, because that, that, that's kind of a novel idea still to this day in the recording studio industry. He had a really cool way of, of building that. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could revolutionize web design, uh, so to speak, uh, by doing something like this. And, and so as I started to get into web design, I started my side business, honestly, just as a way to be able to buy cool tech toys and write them off as tax expenses. Mm. Uh, I got into web design, um, because because I started in, in the business to work on Mac computers for people and uh, found that they actually didn't need to be fixed as often as would be sustainable for me to have a business. So I started um, one off just saying, okay, well, I'll do this website 
for people. I'll do this website for people. But as I was developing that, I, I immediately had that residual income thing in mind. So there were two things. The first was I was brand new to Divi. I was brand new to actually doing web design on my own, right? And not doing it with somebody else in tandem with somebody else. And I'll be honest, part of the issue was I was uh, nervous. I was scared. How can I charge somebody? Because I was doing my research and I was like, oh yeah, well, you, should, you shouldn't be charging anybody a dime less than $1,500. You know, all the gurus were saying, and you shouldn't be, you know, uh, you know, I mean, an average site should be $3,500, $4,500. And I'm like, how am I, how in the world am I going to call up a business owner and say, I'd like $3,500 of your dollars, please. I've never built um, a website by myself before, but trust me, it's going to work. And, and um, I know that there are different ways to, to kind of handle that sort of thing. And maybe I should have just been bolder, but I'll be honest, part of the reason why I went with the recurring model is because I thought, well, you know, that seems like a lot of money. I don't know how I would come up with um, that sort of money at one time. So I don't know how other people are going to either, but it seems to me like businesses are used to paying for line items every month that they have as a part of their expenses. What if their web design and marketing was just kind of one of their line items? They just paid for it every month and they had a consistent uh, and they had a consistent service. So I'll say that. And then one other thing um, about that is the other problem I noticed whenever we were building websites, back in those days with the recording studio, what we would do is we'd build a website and then the people who we built it for would never touch it again. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is it would get um, eaten with malware and Google would blacklist it and just all sorts of problems came about from never uh, actually properly maintaining the website. So before I even knew about maintenance plans and all the different things that you could do, I thought, well, if, if I could charge somebody one monthly fee that was reasonably priced and that included building the website too and managing it throughout a specific term, I said, I know I'm going to have some details to figure out, but that sounds like a great way to start. So that's how I started. I never charged somebody. Uh, I, I take that back. I charged one guy $400 one time to build a website. And other than that, I have never done a website for anything other than uh, this monthly subscription um, or an hourly rate. And even that has been super rare. It's, it's pretty much been the subscription model. Yeah, that's fascinating. I can't believe you started out like that. That's too cool, man. It's awesome. And I love that your background is unorthodox. And we talked about this before we went live, but I swear, man, the best web designers are, are savvy like that and just different types of entrepreneurs. A lot of them come from different creative fields and the musician world, a surprising, a surprisingly large amount of people come from the music world into, into web design and other creative fields. And I love that the, re the recording studio, the, your, your, your second dad, as it were, uh, planted that seed because how crucial is that to have a mentor who's doing something like that? How did, I'm just out of pure curiosity as somebody who was a musician and recorded some albums, how did that work in the studio world? Did they have like a band on, because re we recorded when we needed to do an album, but that was it. How did that work? If you could sum that up before okay. we dive in. Yeah. So I'm going to have to, uh, so I was hoping, I was kind of hoping you'd ask that and I was kind of hoping you wasn't because I have the the the, the struck you know that have the outline in my head, but can I remember specifically? Okay, so here was here was the genius of the of the model. So most of what we recorded were like uh, blue. And this I should say too. This yes. is this is good reference for how we can frame our subscription services to clients because they'll probably want to know why would I pay monthly if I can just buy a website and be done with it. Yes. And, and actually, I'm, okay, I'm glad you made that connection because that has to do with how I decided to, because what happens when you need to make big changes to the website and stuff. So, so that actually has, that ties into that. So how, how he did it was is okay, you'd have to come up with the money to record the first time. So again, we were recording family groups, me and and um, and his sons who were all, you know, great friends. They were, uh, they aided in doing the music and things. So he had staff musicians, but then many of these groups also had their own bands too. So this would work either way though. Whenever, <laughs> it was so genius. So uh, we did a lot of CD duplication and things like that too. We had all of that equipment there on, on premise, mm. okay? So- Whenever the person came or the group or whoever, um, you had to, uh, okay, let's just be, make it real practical. So let's say that we were going to charge them $1,500. Most of them were a lot more expensive than that. But let's just say a recording session was $1,500. As part of the recording package, they got enough CDs 
with their order to if where if they were to sell those CDs for $15 a piece, they could pay for the recording session. So it was, so we would give them a hundred CDs as a part of the recording session in this example. Okay. And all, and the sales pitch, he was a great salesman. And the sales pitch was, look, if you could, if, and make sure you don't give any to family and friends, if they love you, they'll support you. They'll pay $15, get those hundred CDs sold and put the money back and you'll never have to pay for a recording session again in your life. Next year when you come, you'll just have that money. And you. And he said, that was the other thing too. If you do this, I will never, ever, I'll go up on my prices on other people in the future. But so long as you record with me once every year, I will never go up on the price again. And oh, so each time we did it. that, he would just, isn't that beautiful? He would give them exactly what they needed for them to be able to come up with that money. And then they would just come back year after year after year. And they were incentivized to come back every year. So that that price never went up upon them. Oh, so many genius things in just that two minutes of what you just said. So first of all, there's more value. It's not just your recording here. There's like, you're, you're provided these CDs. There's some more value here. There's also the extra marketing push and the incentivizing the where very practical. I love how I laid that out where it's like, if you sell just a hundred CDs, you'll make up the cost and then everything out from there is profit. And then the third thing there was, there's an incentive to keep on coming back because my next question was going to be, well, how did they do that? Did it roll over annually? That's what it sounds like it was. So if they come back and keep on coming back, that pricing stays, which is also a huge thing. And one of the questions I had about the subscription model, which I'm sure we'll dive into and how awesome and perfect does that translate to web design? I would imagine that you saw that and was like, okay, if I have a client who wants to do this, but maybe doesn't have four grand right now, Maybe I could sell them on 1500 annually, lock them into that rate. And now I have a question about the size of project and the scope and all that stuff, which we'll get into here, but I love that model. And now one thing that I have talked to clients about is putting it in a very tactile, putting their investment in a very tactile analogy. And just like the CD thing, if you tell that, cause 1500 bucks for a band is a ton of money. I remember when we had to pay like a couple grand for a studio album, I was like, Oh my gosh, two, like back then that was a lot of money. But if you say, you know, sell a hundred albums and then you make your money back, the rest is profit. The same thing could be true for clients. I know for a lot of my clients, if I was charging 2,500 and they would think, man, that's a lot of money. But I, I would often ask them, how much does your average client spend you know, in a year? If it's 500 for whatever the services are, then you would only need to get five clients from your website to recoup that cost. And then everything from there is profit unless you know, barring any ongoing maintenance and stuff. So some valid points on that, Steve. I love that analogy. Um, how did you, so initially, how did you come up with your pricing? Because I do want to talk practically about scope. And I mean, let's be honest, a five page brochure site is way different than an e-commerce site. So I want to talk about that. But initially, how did you do your pricing? Did you have um, like different tiers for different types of projects? Or how did that look when you just started the subscription model? Well, as you can imagine, with a model like this, it really did evolve over time. I mean, my my contract, based on just experiences that I've had with different clients, has had to change based on... Um, based on certain factors. And we, we talk about some of that, but, but like, you know, I, I would, I've, I've treated everything. Let me just make it in, say this in a practical way. Every single client interaction or potential client interaction became a learning experience for me because I didn't have a blueprint that somebody else who had already done this. I mean, you, I, I Googled it and, and like, you know, two years in, I finally found somebody else who was doing it. But even then what they were doing was different. What year? Um, yeah. I was going to ask you, what year did you start doing this? This was probably twenty six, early 2016 16, or late okay. 2015. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and so I, I really didn't have a, like a blueprint that, you know, I, I could go by. So I was sort of, I was making it up as I went along. It first started out really, really flat. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm sure I did some math, you know, based on, on the average numbers, you know, who, do, who doesn't start out doing this and Google, how much should I charge for website design? We've all done that. Right. And so I probably, I probably did some sort of math, but whatever math, Math I did, I came to the conclusion that that seventy five dollars a month would be fair. Um, and in this 
in the case of working with, so to speak, the little guys, especially back then, I had no inclination of going with big companies. I mean, I, I thought maybe even the people who I were employed by would have been too big a website project. You know, I was, my first one I did was for a little uh, HVAC company in Statesville, or excuse me, in Yadkinville, uh, North Carolina, where I used to live. And so I, I thought these, and he was a startup, right? I thought these are just like startup, small mom and pop. I want to help the little guy. Now, are my beliefs on that any different now? Well, I mean, perhaps a little bit. I mean, you can imagine I've learned quite a bit about business since that time. And maybe I would have approached things differently, but I would never trade where I am today. So I'll just take those learning experiences and, and, um, and be thankful for them. But so I started out at $75 a month. And then eventually I went through, well, I could have different tiers. I could have a, a smaller tier here and then a bigger tier here. And I had to learn again, how to cap things in my contract. So uh, I think at the beginning, it kind of started out by saying, okay, if your website fits into this box, it's probably $75 a month. If we need some additional things, then that's considered out of scope. And we'll have to work on that to get, to get a price together for that. Okay. And those kind of things would have been like e-commerce um you know advanced scheduling tools and would you, know, you do, do that to take payment on the site sure yeah. would you do that with like an hourly retainer or just kind of quote that as like a separate kind of add-on like one-time add-on type of fee <laughs> yeah so one of the things that and i'm still debating whether or not this is in the way I have it right now, whether or not this is the best way to do it, but it's, it's how it is right now is if you are on a subscription plan with me um uh, to you know, for a managed website, which is which is what I call them. Um, if you're on a managed website with me, then any hourly work or anything that would be done that's considered out of scope from the original project um, is at thirty percent off of the current hourly rate, which okay. is a little steep, I, I think. But it seems to it seems to be working so far. So my current hourly rate, uh, I, I don't know if you have a problem with me sharing numbers. I'm pretty wide open. Oh I really no, care, I love so. numbers. We all okay. yeah, everyone listening loves numbers here because it's great. <laughs> Because okay. otherwise it's vague and surfacey, and I'm yeah. like, I don't know what the heck that means. Tell me numbers. So, sure. And I do want to sure. make, if it makes you feel any better, 30% sounds about average for cutting your hourly rate. Because that's what okay. I did. We would always do, we'd have about a hundred dollar hourly rate and then for normally, and then for maintenance plan clients, it was 75. So it was almost 30%. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so so right now I have my standard hourly rate at seventy five, and then so my my thirty percent hourly rate would be fifty two fifty. So if you're a current you know client of mine and you're asking for work that goes out of scope, then uh, the hourly rate is fifty two fifty. And now this actually ties in also to another aspect of the model, which is when we're doing the ongoing maintenance, and I'm sure we might talk about that more later, but I'll say for right now that you can't just work on people's stuff indefinitely. That's the one problem with, with this. So I had to, I had to solve that problem and I solved it by saying that after you sign off on the website, that you like it, that you approve of it, that we go into the, uh, the final phase of our working together, uh, which is the care phase where I care for the website. And I give you like an hour of, of, of work per month during that time. And if it goes beyond that, then we're in that to that hourly rate again. You were talking about the, the out of scope type of stuff, which I was very curious about particularly because what I would like to know, you know, it sounds like you're working through some different tiers, but in the early days, you know, you just kind of went for it. Did you have any like terrible experiences with this model in the beginning? Did you have any, or, or did you have the foresight to know, okay, if somebody wants an e-commerce site, this 75 bucks a month, is it going to cut it? What, what did that look like when you first started? <laughs> So uh, believe it or not, I did not have any terrible experiences with this. Um, the uh, the only terrible experience that I've had was was with a client who I uh, it was it was like the second one that I had charged um, for for a for a bigger package than that original base thing. So I had reworked my packages and and I, I was charging this guy um, two hundred and twenty four dollars per month as opposed to seventy five. So you can obviously tell it's a big difference. And I didn't set expectations correctly with him. And even today we have an amicable relationship. Everything's fine. I've done a little bit of you know subsequent work for him on just a one off kind of hourly basis. But that was the only experience that it was like we had 
some crossed wires and signals and things other than that um no like i have not had an experience come about where it was like oh i'm just doing like an obscene amount of work uh for for, for this uh for this amount of money now one of the things that you really have to do though and this is with all memberships all subscriptions and, and i'm i've just i've just always been a fan of that model so i think in these terms you have to play the long game you just really, you just really do. And so one of the downfalls, one of the pitfalls to this kind of model is, you know, you're not going to be hiring a ton of help right off the, off the bat because getting 75 bucks a month from clients, you just can't afford that. You're going to be doing a lot of the work, um, yourself. And so what you're going to do, like even now, so now I am starting to work with some people and maybe we can talk about that, but as I'm working with them, the reality is, um, the project that they're working on, I won't be profitable on that project for maybe three or four months. But then you have to remember that by, by the time comes month four or month five, from that point on, every whatever that monthly check is, which some websites now are more like $800 instead of $75, right? It's, it's evolved quite a bit. And so, you know, I realized that in those first couple of months, okay, I might not be making the money from them, but I'm being sustained by the projects that I've done in the past. And then these new projects are going to start paying off for me every month after month, month three or month four. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to be a nice, nice solid income for me. So it well, takes a little while to build it up. Yeah, I love that. I'm so glad you said that because that has to be the mindset for sure. It's a long game, but you build trust, you build loyalty with clients and your bottom line increases one step of the way. Just like when I launched my maintenance plan, it was amazing every month to see the line go up. And then it was like, oh my gosh, my mortgage is covered. Oh my gosh, my mortgage and a car payment is covered. Oh my gosh, my mortgage and two car payments are covered. Like that's when it gets amazing. And I think for you too, I think your, your uh, headphones cut out right when I was saying this, but um, with your hourly retainers, that's another great way to bring in a little flows of income, particularly if they need to add e-commerce or like a 10 hour chunk of time. That's a great way to bring in some help and add a little more, uh, oomph on some of those months as well. And I was going to tell you, uh, I'm going to put my coaching shoes on it and tell you that I think your rate should be probably at least 95, maybe a hundred an hour, and then cut that down to 75 for clients. So, um, we'll have a little coaching session after this, but that would be my recommendation to you. Uh, but I love yeah, that. I can agree. Yeah. Cause yeah, 50 bucks. That's yeah. You're, you're even with it, where your design is at now. I think you're definitely worth that. So that, that would be my recommendation as your coach. But, uh, I love that, that mindset because that is what it has to happen now. When you started all this, what did the terms look like? Cause this is what I'm really fascinated by. Did you lock them into a certain term? Did they have to do everything with you or cause I could see, I'm just going to play devil's advocate. I could see a client getting their new website built for 75 bucks a month. They're on with you for three months and then they disappear. How do you protect against that? And what did the terms look like to be able to make sure they're, you know, they're with you for, for a long time? Yeah, that's a great question. So believe it or not, I so I cannot remember on those first two or three whether or not I had a sort of um, – whether or not I was using this sort of language around it. But but what, what eventually ended up developing at least was a lease – um, sort of terminology. So I, I, I use the word contract, but lightly, um, I say this con I think in the contract, I actually say something like this contract is structured similar to a lease. And then I explain what that means. Um, so the terms I ended up coming up with, I think this started being a 12 month thing and then I moved it to 18 months. Okay. So, right. So, so right now, the, the terms go loosely like this. You're going to start paying me before we start this project. And then you're going to pay me this amount per month for a minimum of 18 months. After 18 months comes up, I'm not going to remind you that your payment is done. I'm not, you know, it's none of that. Um, you know, it's, it's, you can continue paying. And if you do, then the managed website benefits continue. If you stop paying, then the managed website benefits cease and we're, you know, we'll, we'll turn everything over to you and the website is, is yours. If they leave, you know, three months into the project, then, um, or, or, or I don't know, that's maybe not a good way to say it. If they, if they leave, you know, two weeks into the build or something like that, and, and I'm, I've already made quite a bit of headway, um, or whatever, you know, the point of the matter is however far we get, it just depends on the project. Um, 
they're going to have to pay until the end of that term. They're going to have to to buy out, so to speak, okay, gotcha. the website. That's now, the language. How, how do you how do you go about the the deadline for the initial bill? Because I would I'm trying to put myself in the client's shoes, and again devil's advocate here. If I were a client that would be like, okay, I'm going to start paying you. But what if the site takes like a year to build? Like, not that you would do that, but how do you guys have like a set deadline as to when it will go live? And then what about content collection and client delays? Or is that an incentive for clients to get their shit to you faster because (laughs) they can get their site up quicker? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what's really funny about this is I understand the, uh, the, the objection, so to speak, or, or the question there, but what's really funny is I actually had to put language in my, in my contract to guard against the opposite happening to guard, to guard against the client dragging their feet and not getting me content so that it took longer than I had planned on working on it. So Mm. I've never had an issue in five years of doing this. uh, I'm just going to say five for simplicity. I think it's around five years of doing this. I have never had an issue where, uh, the, the bill took longer than I, uh, would have estimated that it, that it taken. And I did high estimate. I used to do my estimate before was 90 days and it's, ne- I've never had a bill take anything near that long. So I've actually just recently put it down to six weeks being, being my, my, um, average estimate. And the only time, like I said, I've treated every, uh, every client interaction as a learning experience and have had to adjust things, um, for that. The client that I was mentioning just a minute ago, where I had, um, where, oh, uh, sorry, my, my video cut out there. Uh, oh, the, 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 the client I was mentioning, um, just a moment ago, uh, that where we had a little bit of a, of a problem that was part of the issue from my standpoint, this was a one pager. It was a landing page. That is all it was. And I kid you not, we were six months into oh. the build at the moment that I realized that we were still, we, we were still having like random one hour, uh, one hour long calls over my, uh, over my lunch break at work. And for we a one were, page, uh, for a one page yeah, website. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it was just, it would just, it was never ending, frankly, Josh, it was just never ending. And so I said, okay. So after that experience for all future contracts, I built into it. Okay. If this, if this takes any longer than than 90 days due to your failure to meet deadlines, et cetera, then it's actually going to be for every hour that is spent beyond that working on the site. Uh, it's going to cost you uh, an hourly rate. So okay. I, so I did it so, to protect my time. It's, it's never been the opposite problem. Um, yeah. That's great. Cause yeah, I was curious about that as well, because with that model, I would think, yeah, what's the incentive to, to finish it? I've, of course, most everybody wants their website done quick, but there are those people who just seem to drag on and delay and delay, and it could take a year in that model unless you cap it. So that's a good, that's a good thing to put in the contract for sure. Now, did you, have you at all, you know, you're five years into it. I want to talk about how you built it up to, to where you were very stably able to go full time. But before that, how did the pricing change? And did you grandfather in everybody in at those old rates? What are your rate ads now before you went full time? What did that look like as far as the progression of how this model, you know, grew for you? Yeah, good question. So I definitely grandfathered people in. I've, I've never came along and said, okay, I'm going to start charging you more now. And honestly, that's made for some awkward things. It's like, you know, right now, so my rate right now for the starter website, you know, this is basically like, you don't work with me unless you're paying this much um, for as if you're a business anyway, is, is 197 per month. Okay. And then I give ministries and nonprofits uh, a 30% uh, discount off of that on the, on the monthly rate. Uh, but it's, so it's 197 a month that I've, you know, the awkward thing is like, as I've learned how to value my time and manage my time more, et cetera, you know, it's like now people are paying 197 a month. And part of that ongoing maintenance contract, they only get one hour uh, of work now back in the day. Like, so I have some clients right now who are still paying me at that 75 level and they actually get two hours worth of work because that was the deal back then. And so gotcha. you, you do have some awkward things like that, but I really think it's important to honor those who have been with you, um, who have been with you for a while. And they, I mean, I've got, I've got clients today who've just been consistently paying my bills for five years straight. I'm just going to continue to honor that man. And through, you know, th- through the thick and thin, whatever comes, you come what may. Yeah. So. And I know, well, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but you went full time. You know, it's not like you had hundreds of clients 
on this <laughs> model. It was a couple dozen, but that was enough. That was enough. So yeah, I love that idea of yeah. of honoring that. Particularly, I mean, if it's something where it's like super costly, it's worth reevaluating and just being upfront with your clients. But even then, I would still give a big discount. In most cases, it's fine. I did the same thing with my maintenance plan. I actually, I don't know if you knew this, Steve. I actually started my maintenance plan at seventy five, and I took it down to fifty nine for clients, and mm-hmm. I lowered I their rates. And everyone who I lowered their rate, cause I was getting questions about 75 a month. And then as soon as I went to 59, the question stopped. I don't know what it was. There was a big, interesting psychological price difference between those two prices, but 59 just seemed to be more at ease for everybody. And everybody who I lowered their rates, they're still on our maintenance plan today. I never had any one of them cancel. So there's a lot of power in that and grandfathering those old rates in. But again, your business does have to grow and you have to, you know, literally support things. Now, what's interesting about that price range is 197, you're looking at you know, over two grand a year per average, 2,400 ish for, for an average type of site, but you'll have some extra with, uh, you know, hourly retainers. And I think what's interesting about this model, and that's probably scary is that you would think, well, if I'm going to have a ton of clients every month, it's going to be too much work. But would I be correct in saying that the bulk of the work is when you're developing this site, but then once that's done, it's not easy sailing, but there's much less work ongoing after that. Right. Absolutely. So the more, and of course, these tools that people have developed for for automating and assisting with your, you know, maintenance and stuff, manage WP and and uh, the hub uh, from WPMU, you know. Tools like that are just awesome. I mean, they're just they're just amazing. I mean, honestly, it's really the coolest thing. You're right. The first couple, you know, a few weeks to a couple months, you know, you're you're living inside of this project a lot, right? Because you're working on it. But once once these and I have four different phases of a project. Maybe we could talk about that. But like once we get into care phase, the final phase, it is mostly smooth sailing from there. It's very rare that I have to do lots of ongoing maintenance. And that's why, you know, we have people um, in, in the WordPress and Divi community who um, uh, you don't know exactly who I'm talking about. Some people have, have businesses specifically for handling the ongoing maintenance for other people doing the white label maintenance. Now, yeah. maybe I'll get there one of these days, but for me, I don't see a need for that. The, the, need, the, the maintenance work for me is so minuscule, so minuscule yeah. that it's really, it's really crazy. It's, it's really something to start to, to see checks hit the bank for these dollar amounts that you're doing very little work for it's true. in that month. It really yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I remember um, I was, t- I was a little afraid of that when I started my maintenance plan, I was like, Oh my gosh, am I just going to be loaded with, cause at one point as a solo printer, I was managing 70, I think about had about 75 websites and that was awesome. But I was really nervous about that. But you know what? I had maybe, 10 clients who were actively doing updates. Most everybody else, it was nothing. And a lot of those were clients that had multiple sites. So they might have a change on one site, but then the other two sites were fine. So there is a lot of power in that. And that's that works perfectly with the subscription model. So I, I do want to hear about those phases. So I imagine the, the build is part one. Is that right? Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I, I cleverly named them because, and actually it's not the, that, no, that's not, part one is collect. Okay. So, um, yeah. Hit me with so, the phases. Hit me with the phases. Okay. So, so the, the broad overview is collect, create, critique, and then care. Everything okay. has to be alliterated because I, I teach at church and you just have to alliterate things. Right. The so, four C's. um, yes, yes. The four C's and, and the whole model as I lay it out has like five or six P's. So, so anyway, uh, so that would be the four C's, right? The process is collect, create, critique, and care. You know, it's, it's pretty obvious, but, um, so collect is first for a couple of reasons. Um, after I get a contract signed and have to do basic onboarding, um, it's kind of nice to have a little bit of breathing room. It's like, okay, the project has started. I maybe even have already seen a little bit of payment come through and now the monkey is immediately on their back. I've always loved that. There's something nice about, okay, I'm now waiting on them. Um, so I, before I start, and you guys can hopefully identify with this, but before I start, I want to have everything that I can possibly have. I want to have images. I want to have all the copy as done as possible. So I want things first 
because that way I, I know how to arrange the stuff on the site. Now we all have situations where that doesn't happen quite as perfectly as we'd like it to, you know, I've got a, a current an active bill right now where, um, you know, she wanted the site live uh, by the end of February. And it turns out that she's not even going to have pictures back until the beginning of March. So it's like, okay, well, just so you know, we're not going to have a website without your pictures. So, right. um, so, so, so collect is first. So I like to, to, to get, and I use Content Snare, Basecamp, all these different tools work together to hopefully get as much content in place before I say, okay, now we're going to sit down and create. Okay, so that's collect. Move into create. We create the homepage, pretty standard stuff. I do a, a Loom video with a build walkthrough of the of the homepage Way to, to get their blessing. Yeah, yes. on the on the design. Um, and uh, speaking of uh, of that coaching earlier, I would love to hear a, a little bit of your thoughts about doing the uh, the Loom video for the contract. I still haven't figured out the, or the proposal. I haven't figured that out yet in my context. So maybe you can tell me about that sometime. Um, but Deal. yeah, so we we do the as, as soon as we get the blessing on the uh, on the homepage, then we go through and and pretty much build out the rest of the site uh and then we move into critique so this is the revision phase so this yeah. is where we're actively going through and saying i want this change i want this change and i had to put specific language uh in in the contract to help with revisions as you can imagine because sometimes that can get a little unwieldy yeah. um and so I've got some language around that. So but that's again, the revision phase. The, the incentive of this subscription model is the longer they do revisions, they're paying for a site that isn't up. Yes, that's true. That is true. And so there, there's, there's definitely a, you know, the, the biggest issue for me though is, is the, so long as we keep going back and forth, that's mental energy and physical time that sure. I have to expend thinking about it. And so if I kind of, um, scare them up front with like, look, you got basically three rounds to get this thing right. Uh, then, it, and, and you know what? It never has come down to that. It's never come down to me saying, oh, we're on your third round of revision. You better be careful. It's just one of those things that's there. And it kind of like subconsciously guides how they react. It, uh, yes. Yeah. That's with anything that's, I hate to use the term scare tactic, but anything in your contract that is a little more assertive, that's like, yeah. you know, you only have three revisions, otherwise it'll cost extra or any of that type of verbiage is, is good to frame the situation for your clients. And the cool thing about having that is like you said, unlikely that that'll happen. But in that rare case that it is happening, you'll have some ground to stand on instead of being completely screwed yeah. with scope creep. Yeah. Yeah. Very few things in my contract that are there as a result of even those learning experiences are because I had just a terrible experience. It was, it was just, it was almost like, well, I could very easily see how this could lead to that. So I'm going to put this in there to guard against it. That's and I've true. never, I don't think I've really ever had to go back to the contract and see, see here on this line where we had this, like, you know, it's, it's never been like that. I'm sure it may, may maybe one day and I'll be really thankful that I have some of this, but definitely that's there just to more guide the, the relationship. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of the critique phase, they have to sign, and this is key. This is key to the way my model works is they have to sign a build uh, sign off form that basically says they are happy with the site. They understand that, you know, it's built to the specifications that we agreed upon originally. And they understand that going forward, you know, basically we're not going to spend an indefinite amount of time making adjustments and changes. You get an hour per month, you get, you know, your managed website benefits, security, maintenance, performance, the whole nine yards. And after you sign this, that's what we're in. And then we go to, to that phase, which is called the care phase. And so that's, that's, and that carries on through to, um, currently it's at 36 months where I offer to actually essentially start the process over again in okay. 36 months. And that would be the equivalent to where, uh, in the recording studio, you know, we had the CDs and they could come back every single year. And as long as they came back every year and used that money again, you know, and we would give them CDs to pay for the next one. And they would just never have to actually pay for their own recording session ever again. That's good. Same thing almost with the website here. Every, every three years or so, uh, we'll go back in and make some, you know, design changes and major updates uh, that might go beyond that standard, you know, one hour per month that's needed. And there's no addi additional charge for that. At that point, you can do some math. They've already paid, they've paid me for three years at at least 197 bucks a month, if not more. Um, that's pretty good math in my book, especially for the type of sites that I'm working on. Um, yeah, so it I just, it would be like in my case, three years was a good standpoint to reevaluate a site for sure. I like that you said that because I always did that with clients, whether it was just revamping the front page or maybe 
not doing a full website re revamp, but maybe changing some design elements, things that would be more than your average monthly type of hourly work. That was pretty common. Most of my sites, we didn't do like a full, complete blow up rebrand until about five years. There was a couple of cases where I would do a site in 2013 and in 18, we just, we did a complete revamp. But for you, that's a perfect segue. And I was going to ask about that, how you manage that with those decent revisions. So once it comes time where the quote unquote contract, the lease is up, that's your time to reevaluate. And then if they sign on for another 36 months or 18 months or whatever, that's when you would offer to do another round of extensive updates. Is that right? Am I understanding that right? Sort of. Yeah, sort of. Yes. I, um, so part of it is, is to just, just being a salesperson and, and the language that you use, but like I frame it as if we are getting married, right? Like we are, we are in a relationship for the rest of our lives together. We will continue working on this thing. We'll keep molding it. We'll making it better. As far as I'm concerned, if they sign that first document and then they sign that initial build sign off, other than build sign offs, when, whenever we do a major amount of revision, um, I don't plan to ever have them, you know, sign on the dotted line again. I mean, I, sure. you know, if they want to leave and then come back later, that's maybe one is it thing. More, uh, but is it more like renewing your vows? Is that the kind? Is that the kind of yeah. way to look at it? Yeah, that's actually. I need to start using that analogy. That's there actually go. pretty good. Re that's actually those. pretty good. There, you're welcome. Yeah. Renew those web design subscription vows. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I just want to be the the web guy. I mean, I want to be your web guy. You know, some people have lawyers and doctors. You know, some people go to the same doctor for their entire life. I want to be your web guy. Why go to somebody else? If you're having yeah. a great experience with me and you like the design, as long as I keep the website profitable for you and and looking nice, unless you go out of business, why end? You know, let's, let's stay together. You well, know? and let's be honest. The reason I love this is because once you become that trusted person, that web professional for them they're probably not going to remember when the terms are up. I wouldn't. Like if I started working with you and I'm a business owner focused on my own business, if I love Steve and, and now that you're growing your team and I love what you're up to, I am not going to remember when the heck that's up. Maybe some people will, but I wouldn't. And I would not want to drop you. Like if you say, you know, hey, the term's up, but we're, you know, now's the opportunity to revamp some stuff. I can do that for you. I'm going to be all about it. That's a great way to kind of have another really good sales cycle to where, again, you're not redesigning sites every few years and hoping a client will redesign with you. You're they're, they're your client again, again and again and again. So I love that. I'd love to end this conversation, Steve, because I, I appreciate you being so open with how the model works and everything. This has been a great um, kind of peek behind the curtain with how you're doing this successfully. I want to talk about how you took this recently full time, because like you said, this was a slow growth strategy. This is probably, you know, if somebody has a lot of risk and they need to make a lot of money faster, there probably have to be some different not different ways to go about this, but you might have to to get more clients or add more one-time services and different value into this. You were able to, to play the long game with this, but I'll never forget when you joined my web design club recently, you said my business is on the subscription model and it's allowed me to go full time without you know, being terrified or without not having you know a bottom line and having that feast and fathom, fa uh, excuse me, Feast and Famine, which is fascinating. I love that approach because for a lot of students who go full time, there is more risk and there's there's a lot more pressure. And obviously, tons of people are doing it, but there just is more pressure and risk that way. Whereas your model really alleviated a lot of those problems that a lot of folks have by by doing that. So yeah, when did you always plan on going full time eventually, or did you get to a place where you thought okay? Bills are covered. This is covered. I could do this and really grow it. What did that look like? Because uh, you just went full time in January 2021, yeah. right? Yeah, that's correct. So this is a, a multifaceted uh, discussion. I'm going to try my best to organize my thoughts here. Um, the answer is yes, I did plan on going full time, but that is not to say that I had any earthly idea how that was going to shake out. <laughs> um, here was the goal. The goal was by the time my son turns five, again, this is a conversation that we were having um, in late 2015, early 2016. The, the goal was by the time my son turns five, we want to do some homeschooling with him and I want to be able to leave the job and come home full time by myself. So that Beautiful. was the overarching five-year plan. Okay. So is that, so is that the son who just walked by and knocked on your desk? 
Uh, no, that would be uh, he's number three. So we call oh, okay. him three, right? He, Emery, yeah, he's, uh, well, he's hey, two. We're, um, we're both we're both work from home dads. My girls are outside my door being wild right now, so you might hear them in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a fun time. There's always a party going on here. That's one of the challenges. Uh, okay, but we can't, we can't Cha- do that right now. Okay? Yeah, it's a, um, <laughs> a challenge is a good way to put it. It's not a problem. It's, it's a challenge, but it's all good. That's awesome yeah. though. You're able to do that, man. Again, we're work from home dad. So yeah, that's interesting to hear that that was a big, you know, underlying factor for you in going full time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it was. And so, um, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago. So fast forward, I, I had taken on some clients, obviously in that time doing it totally, uh, part-time. And then about a year and a half or so ago, I took on a white label, uh, client who, uh, did some work in a town near me and, uh, he was actually doing, so he's doing like hosting, uh, building up his own hosting business and he needed somebody to come in and actually start to handle most of the website design. And so we had an arrangement I mean, again, I'm a fan of that monthly subscription. So we had an arrangement, whereas he was paying me uh, every week. Um, and so we could, we could just call it monthly or whatever. He was paying me a certain amount to do work that if, as long as it on average worked out for him and for me, you know, maybe it, my effective hourly rate would be more or less one month or whatever, but as long as it averaged out, okay, uh, it was good. Um And so as we continued on um, doing that, the work for him got more and more. And, and about October of last year, I had a phone call with him. You know, we, I got into work during the pandemic for three months from home um, for the law firm. And I was like, man, this is cool. I'm I'm ready to do this. So I called him in October and had a conversation and said, look, I'm ready to take this to the next level. Um, What do I need to do to get it to where we can bump up what what you're paying me? And so we started working on that and And then, so the goal was to incrementally increase it. And by the time we got to January, it would be such that it would be a little tight. I had to rework my budget, rework my finances a little bit, but the goal was, okay, by then, um, I'm just doing it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And our, our, our arrangement is going to be what it is. And then I will go from there. So when I left the law firm, um, I left with that white label client representing over half, just, just over half Mm. of what I was making per month. Um, all during the time, you know, that I was working, uh, and doing this part time, you were, you were doing it for a law firm, right? While you were building. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was doing it for the law firm. I was doing this web design stuff on the side and I was also focused on growing like an online ministry type of thing that I was doing. So Mm. my attention was really divided. So I didn't do as much marketing in the business and stuff as I should have been doing. So the slow growth that I had was actually my fault, I think, um, for not giving it as much. But so when I went full time, I went under that, um, you know, premise of, well, I don't know if another bit of work will even come in, but you know, I'm just, you know, kind of living on a prayer here and hopefully this will continue to work out uh, and we'll go from there. And so that's the terms that I left under. I, I left the law firm and said, okay, we're just going to do this. And um, as you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I messaged you. I joined the club bef- just before I made this leap, I guess, middle of December. And one of the first things I messaged you was, um, well, look, here's the deal right now. I'm just trying to get five clients by June to, to help. Like if I could take on five new clients by June, right. I would feel better. Um, because Because you're still in that part-time mindset and then you don't realize when you give something your full attention, wow, can things happen when you give it your full attention? Yes, that is so very true. That is so very true. I said, look, I'm, I'm just looking to, to offset this a little bit because this one client is responsible for over half of my income. I feel like I should fix this. And um, I, I left, I went, I went full time. January 15th was my last day at work. And since then I've taken on, it's either six or seven new clients on a monthly basis. And, um, I've essentially, you know, without getting too much into numbers here, I've, I've just about equaled what that white label client pays me in new business that I've taken on, um, since leaving, leaving the law firm. So awesome, Um, man. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I, I, I before I forget this, I want to get this off my off my chest here. There's a about the finances because the you did kind of allude to like, well, how does this work? Like, because um, you do have to do some advanced planning and things. And I just want to share one thing real quick that I'm learning um, from this, and that is, so I'm really big on budgeting. I'm really big on like sinking funds and like you know, basic the basic idea of a sinking fund is if you want to spend you know twelve hundred dollars at Christmas, you're going to need to put aside a certain 
certain amount of money per month mm -hmm. in order to get to that $1,200. And then that's a lot better than randomly having $1,200 in December. Um, you see the point there. So if it's a hundred dollars a month, it's a lot easier than $1,200 in, De in December. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, and I'm just starting to do this. I'm, I'm ashamed that I haven't done it since, uh, or yet, but I am starting to apply that mindset to having money set aside for working with contractors and things on these, on these sites. I had an okay. issue just the other day where I had a site went, that went down and I had to pay a contractor. Uh, I got to pay, I should say a contractor who I met in, in the group. Who's really, really awesome um, uh, to, to help get this website back up. And that was $150 that right now, like there's no money set aside for that. That's just money that, that I'm not going to get to take home from my family. But if I was constantly every month setting aside, say 5% of every of the top line that comes in, then there's always money ready and waiting there for me to be able to pay somebody else to fix the, an issue if it comes up and it lies outside of my expertise or, or my time. Yes. So with, yes. with delegation, that certainly would help. So the finances are a big deal. You have to be good with money, I think, to make this work. And also, I mean, on that mindset, that that premise right there, you just hit the nail on the head. It's your time that you got back. You know, if, if you know sh whoever you hired out, if they can fix that, you know, in three times faster than you can, then that's worth it because you can devote your energies yes. to getting more clients and, and doing some of the stuff like that. I actually want to know real quick with those six to seven clients that just rolled in did you do anything new with your marketing or did you get the word out more what um yeah what did you do or did it just kind of <laughs> just kind of happen no you know and that's where i hesitate to take the credit and say that oh this is just going to happen uh or this is the the you know step one step two step three to getting seven new clients the first week of year i mean i'm sure i could like you know put a put a funnel out there and make some make some money with that kind of headline but you know the reality is they just they just rolled in man they I put in, I put out one Facebook post and said, this is, this is what's happening. And it's been random. It's just been, it's just been totally cool. Like, um, I, one of the uh, ones that came in was a referral from a graphic designer who actually, my wife lost, uh, Technically, there's more to it, but she technically lost the bid on a graphic design job to another graphic designer. I built a little relationship with the graphic designer because I do the, her client's web work. And then before we ever even got to work together on anything, the graphic designer referred one of her clients to me for a website. And so it's just been little things like that. Um, that have uh, that have happened, and I'm sure one or two came as a result of that little Facebook post. But but that's all I've done. I'm just now because I've. Um, started working on my delegating more, which I was really bad at before. And thanks to some of your podcast episodes, that's definitely helped uh, awesome. me to, to figure that out. But I'm just now considering actually getting out and starting to do a little bit of marketing um, because to this point, I have just been drowning in the work and figuring out the processes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Well, we're recording this before these next couple episodes come out, but uh, do yourself a favor, favor, Steve. Keep an eye out because we're recording this at the end of February, episode 100 and 102, or excuse me, 10, yeah, 100 and 101. Those will be game changers for you because it's all about delegating and working less and making more. Uh, so I'm super excited to hear how those help you out because, yeah, you you get to a point where, where totally. you're at now, you you are hitting that scaling side of things, which is different, which is different in the subscription model, which is, which is really, really interesting, but awesome. And I'm excited. I, I think it'd be great to do a follow up with almost like how to scale the subscription model, mm -hmm. because that's a whole nother ball game. So let's, let's keep track of this journey, man, that you're on. Cause I love it. I love what you're up to. I love what you've been through. And I love that your mindset has, has led you to this point. I want to find out real quick, how many clients, cause I know you're a numbers guy and I appreciate you sharing numbers. How many clients did you have when you went full time? Um, I, that's a good question. I think it was like 11. <laughs> that I'm, is, I'm, I'm dead serious. I mean, yeah. that's just freaking amazing because how many people stress themselves out with the feast and famine one and done work where you feel like you have to sell three websites a week to make it. That is like, that's a recipe for just burning yourself out and then rather taking on a job at Mc, you could make more at McDonald's yeah. if you destroy yourself with, you know, with, with killing yourself for these cheap projects over and over. So uh, just a dozen clients and you were able to, to make that enough over the years to, to go full time. That is cool. And did a lot of those have yeah. like the white, that would include the white label that had like several sites it, and stuff. 
It did. I, I should, I should say real quick that, um, part of it is a mentality thing. So I mentioned I'm big, obviously because of subscription, I'm big into the membership model. Mm -hmm. So I treat, and even use this language on my website, I treat this as almost like a high end membership. That's how I treat it. And so I don't, I don't want, I don't need 30 clients at one time. You know what I mean? Like if, the, if okay, if that comes in fine, but like at the stage I'm at right now, I don't need that. I would rather have solid relationships who I am the web guy for 15 or 20 people than have to work on a new site, three new sites every month, just to, just to scrape by. Yeah. And I was actually just looking at, let's see, I'm look, doing some numbers here, even though I'm terrible at numbers for the most part, but if you did, <laughs> let's see, let's see. So, yeah, like even, you know, 10 to let's just let's make it easy. I mean, one one ninety seven times 10, that's a couple grand a month. If you even if you work to double that or add the more value that it's you could see where it's just a little bit of tweaks here and there I could easily take that up to six figures a year to where if you you know, if you're able to get to seven, eight thousand dollars a month with the extra hourly work retainers and then those bigger type of uh, subscription models, it's very feasible. You could build a six figure business, you know, fa faster than what you did. But like you said, because you you delayed, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, just like I did, I delayed at scaling, but it wasn't until I scaled that things really blew up for me. Right. And but you can do it a lot faster, which is really cool. But Either way, it's still a long game approach, but at the same time, pros and cons with everything, you were able to have a much more stable transition to doing this full time, which is so awesome, man. So, so pumped and proud of you, Steve. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, it's, it's the more that you can offer to like, you know, different people have, you know, well, I offer this kind of service. I offer this service. I offer this service more than anything. I want my things to be all inclusive. So I yeah. have a couple clients who are on a a, you know, a six hundred and ninety-seven dollar a month website subscription that gets more work with marketing and 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 SEO and even sales funnels and things. So, um, the more you can offer, you can just keep creating higher tier packages and and just take it to town. Yeah, that's great. And the the old adage: ten percent of your clients are willing to pay you ten times as much right now. That's right. That is a really important thing to have in mind with the subscription model. Because yeah, you might have some of those clients where eh, two ninety seven a month is at the top of their budget, but you're going to have some clients that are willing to spend a thousand bucks a month, and those could really mm -hmm. even out to where again, you could barely get to it. You could really easily get to not easily, but very practically get to a six figure business with that model. So, yeah. I love love that, man. For One sure. final question here, but where, um, where would you like my audience to go to check you out? Cause you have your website, but you also have a YouTube channel. Is there something that you'd like me to link in the show notes that you'd like, you know, all my <laughs> listeners and, and fellow web designers to check out? Yeah. So, um, that's a, that's a really good question. So I am, uh, uh, working on building up a YouTube channel. I haven't been very consistent with it at the beginning of the year, unfortunately. Um, but I'm working on building up a YouTube channel. I honestly, I don't even know what it's called right now. I think it's just Steve Schramm dash North Max services, which is the name of my business. But I'm, what I'm putting out there is helpful tips related to web design and also kind of hacks for Mac computers. I know a lot of web designers use Macs. And so there are some really awesome tools like that are available available on set app and other things that you can actually use to hack your time um, and hack your processes even. And so I'm, I'm teaching some of that stuff on the YouTube channel. Otherwise, my business site is northmacservices.com. And I'm all about building white label relationships and, and just other contractor relationships. So you can always just go to northmacservices.com and learn more about me and reach out to me there. Cool. And then I'll, I'll link your YouTube channel too. I know you posted that in the club recently with some of your videos. So I'll, yeah. I'll make sure, excuse me, we get that linked in the show notes. So last question for somebody who is considering this model, what would be like one piece of advice? If you could go back and tell Steve five years ago, what's one thing you might do differently? Obviously this episode is the, the roadmap, the game plan, plan to follow, but what's one thing mm -hmm. you may, may have done differently or that you would suggest mm -hmm. somebody think about? Yeah, yeah, that that's a uh, that's a really I'm, interesting. I'm question. sure it'll be ten. I'm sure it'll be ten or fifteen things. But if there's just like one that takes prominence, yeah. what, what jumped in your mind? Yeah. Um, um, 
gosh, I guess I would say you have to figure out the budget. I don't even, I don't even know like necessarily the practical way to, to frame that, but like budgeting has been a huge key to the, just the general success of my family. And I know that might sound odd to say, oh, well, the best way to become a web designer is to have a good budget. But if you don't have your personal finances down and you, you don't have it figured out to what you really need every month, then you're just kind of shooting in the, in the dark. Um, so I would say if you're going to start planning on a sub, making mo- you know a subscription-based model, I would start figuring out the bare minimum that you needed to make your household budget go. Because like you said, the, it, the sooner you can jump into it full-time and your business gets full-time attention, you'll get full-time results. Full-time attention is going to breed full-time results. Yeah. So ha- as quickly as you can get into that. Well, that's good. And and I mentioned episode 101 earlier in that one, my business coach, James Trampko, who was on that interview, he, he says it best. You have to literally, before you start a business, put your numbers into a spreadsheet and see if it'll work. And I think what you're hitting on yeah. is perfect because particularly for a subscription model, you don't want to start your subscription at a price point that's too low. Because if you're, if you need, let's say you need to take home 2,500 a month for your family. Well, if you are, you know, if, if your prices are insanely low and even if you get 10 clients, if you're only bringing in 1500 a month, that's, that's not even, you know, not only is that not even covering your, your monthly expenses, but that's not going to cover taxes and everything else. So you definitely need to make sure you have it on a spreadsheet and just, I, I would encourage everybody write out what would be ideal. Like I, I'm a, I definitely encourage everyone to shoot for the stars, open your mindset up and think bigger, but at the heart of it, know what you need to make, know where you want to be, and then just write that out. And there is a lot of power. And I think you've probably seen this, Steve, when you write something out and visualize it and look at like, okay, I, let's see, tw- I need to take 2,500, you know, a home each month. I should probably, let's see, if I were to do you know, a hundred bucks a month per client, 20, 25 clients a month paying a hundred bucks a month would be right there. But again, that's not including expenses. So I need to shoot for 35 clients a month. So 35 clients a month at a hundred bucks is going to be the 3,500 mark a month. So like that little practical exercise just told me, okay, I could shoot for 25 clients at that price range, or if I want to keep at 25, I want to keep a couple dozen clients. If I double the rate to 197, like you did instead of 97 or 99, then that would take care of it right there. So there's a, just a practical example. Put your numbers on a spreadsheet, on a paper to see what you actually need. And believe it or not, that'll give you confidence in sales and closing because oh, yeah. you know what the value is. And as you continue to add more value, raise those rates immediately. So I, I back that up, man. I love that. Yeah. Love that idea. Yeah. I mean, awesome. Well, Steve, man, this is great. I know I got to run here, but uh, this was a blast of a conversation. I, I Again, super proud of everything you've done. Congrats on going full time. And we've just started the journey here, man. So keep notes. Keep, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not a journaler, but I do tend to keep mental <laughs> notes of every stage of, of life with business. So definitely keep track of all your biggest lessons learned. Of course, you're welcome to share them in the club, which I know you do. You've been an awesome member there. Just, just a reminder for everybody, when you join the Web Design Club, you meet Steve and folks who are doing awesome stuff. So, uh, I hope that's been beneficial for you and, and yeah, man, keep track of all the, all these lessons learned because I'd love to, to do a 2.0 on this as you scale because yeah. scaling a subscription business, that's what I'm really excited to dive into the next time I have you on. Yeah. That's what I'm working on right now. I've got, uh, I've got two people now that I'm working with on a very regular basis. So, uh, or starting to, so yeah, I'm really excited to see where it goes. Whoop, whoop. Awesome, man. Steve, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on, man. Looking forward to chatting soon. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Hey, guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback, and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts, and search this episode number, and you'll find all the links, descriptions, and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.